before we start, let me just share with you what I had in mind, and that is, uh, I think that the document that we present to you today is self-explanatory and has far more information than you could possibly digest in a day, but uh, has everything you need to know about the city's affordable housing policy. What I intended to do is to offer a few opening remarks and then give you the opportunity to either question me or any of uh, the collaborators here, but rather than everyone speaking at the front end, I think if they could respond to questions that you might have on a specific issue, uh, I, th I think that works best for me if it works best for you. But before we go ahead, maybe the collaborators could introduce themselves. I think most people know other people, but why don't we, Rita, just begin with a little introduction. I'm Rita Markley. I work for COPS, the Committee on Temporary Shelter. Sarah Crappender with Cathedral Square. Brenda Torpy, Burlington Community Land Trust. I'm Tom Dillon. I'm the Housing Development Coordinator for the city. I'm Peter Clavell, and I work for all these folks. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Bettman, I work for the Burlington Housing Authority. Good morning. I'm Ken Sasserosi, and I work for Lake Champlain Housing Development Corporation. Great. So we all set? Bob, you're almost long way from over. The message that we want to deliver to you today is that we have at our doorstep an affordable housing crisis. This is not simply a crisis in Burlington. This is a, an affordable housing crisis that threatens every community in the state and in this country and threatens the social and economic well-being of millions of low and moderate income citizens. You might ask the question, why now? Well, much of this is being driven by dramatic cutbacks in federal support for affordable housing. Since 1979, housing programs have been cut by $656 billion. We are now seeing the largest affordable housing gap in this country in our history. 20 years ago, there was more affordable housing available than people needing them. Today, and this varies from community to community, but on a na national level today, there are two families in need of affordable, low-income housing units for every unit that's available. We're also seeing, as Rita could certainly attest to, many of us could, a dramatic increase in homelessness, not only in Burlington, but in cities across this country. So you couple this affordable housing crisis and the cutbacks in funding with welfare reform and with a global economy that's creating low-wage jobs and is making it more difficult for folks to pay the rent and secure a mortgage. And we have a serious problem. But before we go on to discuss that problem, let me also acknowledge that we have much to be proud of in the city of Burlington. Over the, fa over the past 15 years, we've created in Burlington an affordable housing record that, frankly, few communities can match. In the city of Burlington today, there are more than 1,900 affordable housing units. But the message today is that many of those units and the people that live in them are at risk. And while we're proud of our accomplishments and will continue to be incredibly creative in the city in terms, of, in terms of responding to the affordable housing crisis, we face an enormous challenge. I'm committed to maintaining the city's commitment to producing more affordable housing units, to preserving the affordable housing units that exist, and to protecting our more vulnerable residents, particularly rent, renters, elderly, and members of our community that have disabilities. I'm also here to acknowledge very clearly that the city of Burlington alone cannot respond to this challenge, that we need the support of the state, we need the support of nonprofit agencies, many of them 
represented here today. We need the support of homeowners, of renters, of banks. We need the broad support of, commu of community. And I'm pleased in Burlington, Vermont in 1997, by and large, we have that support. So the primary purpose of today's press conference is to present to you a policy that will guide our efforts as we move towards the next millennium. And this policy recognizes our position as a community, our perspective, that decent, affordable, safe housing is a basic right. It's also a policy that reaffirms Burlington's strategy of creating a housing tenure ladder. You've probably heard of us speak of this ladder, but it's in the last page of the policy document. But it provides a range of responses to housing needs that begin with the bottom rung of shelter housing and continue up the ladder till you have fee simple ownership of housing with many steps and rungs of the ladder in between. This is fairly unique, this strategy, this approach that we here in Burlington have, have uh, embraced. It's a strategy that guarantees the right to stay put and it also assures the chance to move. Ross, this policy that you have before us today also reiterates the vital role that the third sector plays in delivering affordable housing and maintaining affordable housing in the city. We could not do what we've done without the third sector. And the third sector is that rich array of nonprofit organizations represented at this table, and there are few that aren't here, that have played a critically important role in producing and preserving affordable housing and protecting residents. Also in this policy, you'll see that we've set some goals for the next year, for the next few years, and those are quite specific goals. We've also identified short-term actions that must be taken. This policy also spells out the threat of this affordable housing crisis to low-income households. It also looks at what's happening and what's not happening at the state and the federal level. We've done our best to identify resources based on experience in past years. We hope that nearly $7 million will be available in the coming year for investment <coughs> in multifamily housing. But this is a very dynamic and volatile situation. There are changes taking place every day as a result of federal actions and state actions. So this is not money that we can bank on, but based on our past experience, it's a level of resources that we expect will be received. But I also want to point out to you that this is not an esoteric public policy discussion. When you speak about affordable housing, and those of you that are at the city council meeting on Monday night heard this, you're talking about real people, real needs, and real responses from the city and the nonprofit agencies that we work with. We're, we have presented some long-term strategies, but we've also identified some short-term needs. Let me just suggest, and I hesitate to do this because to elevate any need would suggest that this is the only need, this is the only project. But let me just suggest to you a couple of examples of the urgency of the situation that we're dealing with. Right down the street from here at 101 College Street, there are 65 units of subsidized housing, primarily occupied by the elderly. At the end of June of this year, the owner's responsibility to maintain those units as subsidized affordable housing expires. So it's possible that those 65 units of affordable housing could be lost to the housing stock of this city and 65 households that have a roof over their head and rent that they, that they could afford could be put out of that housing. So our challenge is to work with the owner of this property, to work through the Burlington Housing Authority to develop a long-term response which will secure those affordable housing units over the long haul. 
Another challenge immediately. Many of the 1,900 affordable housing units in the city are made affordable as a result of what's called a Section 8 certificate or voucher. These commitments, these rental subsidies from the federal government used to be made available for the long term. No longer. Many of the vouchers and certificates that are available today are available for a year, on a year-to-year -year basis, obviously creating some challenges in terms of long-term security. Another immediate need, and Rita could certainly speak to this, relates to homelessness. We are seeing people stay longer in the homeless <coughs> shelters. The folks that are providing services to Burlington's homeless population certainly have their hands full, but they're also facing a serious reduction in the programs and in the financial resources available to meet the needs of our homeless population. Ironically, the programs that are designed to get people out of the shelters and into permanent affordable housing and into a work situation are the ones that are being cut. So I'm going to stop there, but the point today is that in recent months and years, we have not seen many headlines about affordable housing. We have not heard much public discussion about affordable housing. And while things are, have been apparently quiet, that is not to indicate that all is well. We have some humongous challenges before us in terms of producing more affordable housing, preserving what we have, and protecting the vulnerable of the city. Uh, Burlington will respond in a manner that will be more aggressive and more creative than any community in this country. But I need to tell you that we will have our hands full in responding to this need, given factors, many of which are out of our control, particularly federal funding cutbacks. So I'm going to open up for questions, but I will also would ask that you uh, feel free to address your questions to other individuals who are here. I just would like to know what, um, what is Tom Dillon, he's the housing specialist with CEDL. In general, the definition uh, most widely used is that no more than 30% of a household's income should be used for their rent and utilities. Various funders then take that and say it needs to be affordable to a certain income level at, at that uh, amount of expenditure. So. Unfortunately, they don't all agree on just what that should be. The most critical issue in our community is to see the households who are at 30 percent of median income. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about folks making above the minimum wage in jobs. Often it's more than one job. Often it's seasonal work. But in fact, that's the critical affordability gap um, right now. So I'm trying to get some kind of number to be able, I mean, if someone makes $10,000 a year, I guess if there's a way that we could, I, if you want to stick with poverty level or above poverty level, whatever you think is. Certainly, um, the, 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 the problem with the question, right. I'm just saying, what kind, of household, what kind of housing do we need in the city of Burlington to house the people who are here that need housing? What, what cost do we have? What kind of rent? There isn't one answer. It isn't one kind of housing and isn't one level of income, and that's the whole issue. What we're dealing with, our job here in the nonprofit sector and at the community level, is everybody who can't afford the market rate. With the going market rate works in the market for people whose income matches that market. Our job is for everybody who has a gap between what their earnings are, what their benefits are, perhaps, and what the market charges. And we have to fill that gap through grant funds, rental assistance, so on and so forth. So it goes all the way down the line from if you have an income of 10000 If you have an income of 25000 through the land trust, you may be able to buy a condominium. But that's a figure that, you know, and below that we really couldn't help them. What's so the average rent? The average rent for a two-bedroom 
um, without utilities is close to six hundred dollars. And for that, you want the, the your income. I can figure you can figure that out. So we're dealing with everybody who that's a big chunk of money for a lot of, most of the folks we serve. Below whatever that number is. Yes. Yeah. Is that for a one bedroom or two bedroom? The the point of the housing tenure ladder is to recognize that a, that a healthy situation or system for affordable housing <coughs> addresses a wide range of needs. The needs of elders are very different than the needs of young families. The needs of people who have recently been homeless are different still. Um, the needs of folks who intend to remain in their home, that same home for the rest of their lives is very different from a household that may expect to move again within a reasonable period of time. In trying to build the system, we're trying to hit all the rungs. And that's why there isn't one answer. There isn't one family out there in Burlington, and there isn't one housing solution for everyone in Burlington. And the system tries to do it for everybody. Can you explain the tenure ladder again? I'm not sure I, I follow it entirely. The idea is that there is a diversity of needs, and there is a there is possible. It's possible to have a diversity of the amount of responsibility and ownership that one takes in housing. So it looks at the issue of, of, of tenure, meaning do you own your home do you, or do you rent it? Do you have control of the future of that housing or do you not? And it says that there are a number of different combinations and steps. So one that everybody knows is, is just renting. You don't own the housing. You don't have control of its future. You don't necessarily have control of the ability to remain there after your, your lease expires. At the other end, we all know ownership. We own the place. We can stay as long as we, as we want. Uh, we can change it in any way, for any way we wish within the law. In we're trying to create steps in between to allow a, a situation where one shares some of those rights and responsibilities. The land trust is, is the best known example where the land trust retains ownership of the land, the house belongs to the homeowner. In return, there's a sharing of the equity, the future appreciation of that property. By doing that, we're able to reach households that would not otherwise have any chance at ownership. Instead, they, they're able to participate in ownership through a land trust. Co-ops take that a step further. And we've tried to fill in those gaps so that everybody has an opportunity to continue to move up, to not be stuck in a situation where you only can rent or only can buy. And how does the policy that you're talking about today give people that ability to move up the ladder? It creates, the, it assists in creating the organizations that provide those options. You can't have land trust housing without a healthy land trust. You can't have the opportunities to move from shelter to transitional housing to um, assisted living without having cots and Cathedral Square and Lake Champlain housing out there to manage and create those opportunities. Yes, but don't we already have those agencies? That's why I'm not sure I understand what the policy does. What you have to understand is... We have those agencies. What you need to understand is that the very existence of the agencies and the housing that they have been able to provide over the years is threatened by a variety of forces, most significantly the dramatic cutbacks in federal funds. So the point here today is to allow the community to know <coughs> that we are faced with a crisis and to mobilize the resources of the community and to reaffirm the commitment of this community to deal with affordable housing. And the policy in part reaffirms the strategies of the past. Much of this policy has the fingerprints of John Davis on it. John Davis, in my opinion, is one of the finest minds in this country when it comes to affordable housing policy. He did much work in the city over a decade to establish and to build this housing tenure ladder in coordination with other folks here. But our challenge now is to maintain this ladder at a time when the resources are, are drying up.
but also as the policy indicates, there are a number of specific projects that we will be targeting our resources to. So this document identifies what those projects are. Point by point, short-term action. So this is not, again, an esoteric policy document, but this lays it right out. This is where we're going to be spending our resources for the next year. And, uh, items 1 through 33. Not necessarily in order of priority. Another question. Um, this may not be totally related, but how do you feel about rent control? Um, that's my first question. And also, there has been some rumor of a possibility of Section 8 vouchers and certificates being used to purchase mortgages. Um, of course, that would come from the federal. But um, I was wondering if there would be um, any type of activity to um, support that. Um, as well as rent control, those two issues. Yeah, I mean, in terms of rent control, this is an issue that's been discussed and debated in the past. Uh, there are mixed reviews in terms of the effectiveness of rent control, and you pick up the New York Times any day of the week and you can read of that. There's also a question if the political will in this community exists for rent control, and it certainly has not been the case in the past. In terms of Section 8 vouchers, your specific question was? Um, well, the specific question is, would that be something like, say, the Burlington Housing Authority would support if there was a bill or any type of legislation to move forward to allow Section 8 certificate vouchers, um, certificates and vouchers to purchase mortgages? Um, that even could be something for our interest could, could partake in, too. What we're not interested in doing, and I'll be very honest with you, is, is, is to uh, uh, privatize our very limited and precious stock of public housing. And that's indicated in the, in, in the, in the housing policy. I don't, but that wouldn't privatize yeah. it. They, they I, I, I I'll let you finish this question, then I'll ask it. The purpose here is for a, a press conference, and those of you that our non-press members, if you'd like to have this discussion before or after or any time, fine. But if we could allow the press to raise their issues first before we lose them, uh, I'd appreciate that. But Paul, do you want to speak to the, the specific question? Yes, I can speak to that. Um, I think, Jackie, that um, the expansion and the use of Section 8 is consistent with the housing tenure concept, where we're supporting folks moving from rental housing to home ownership if they want to. So this is a, it's a federal, this is a federal question. It's, it's a regulatory question. And the Burlington Housing Authority would certainly support an initiative that would allow Section 8 recipients to utilize their subsidy as a transition mechanism to home ownership. So if you can create the uh, 100 new housing units in two years from existing um, units already up, you got some construction involved in that. There's new construction That's involved. And that, uh, tell me a little about what you're what you're thinking about now, and will that alleviate a uh, problem that you guys will see with that? I know that's short term. No way. No way. I mean, it's a real objective. It's a, it's measurable, but does that solve the problem? Absolutely not. The way to think about it in terms of goals and short term actions is, it's been decades that brought us to this point, and. It will be many years of steady progress and building on a system that works that solves the problem. Um, I think the 100 units is doable. I think that there are sites that are available within the city limits that uh, will enable developers to participate in creating new family units um, and that we're going to go for it. So this all right, the goals and the objectives that we lay out here are, are feasible, absolutely. I mean, they're, they will be incredibly challenging, but they are feasible. So let me make another point that I did not address in my remarks, but I don't want to miss the opportunity to do so. And that is that Burlington alone cannot address this region's affordable housing shortage. And that there are communities in this region that have people that need affordable housing that have not accepted the responsibility of providing affordable housing. So I'm hopeful that among other things that this press conference today will uh, uh, tweak the interests, the conscience of residents and 
fellow public officials and communities across the state of Vermont, everybody needs to do their share. Uh, Burlington for decades now has assumed a responsibility of providing and preserving affordable housing. Others need to join us in meeting this challenge. Uh, the reality is that market rate housing does not meet the needs of many, many, many Vermont residents. And this is true of residents in Williston, in South Burlington, in Jericho, in Shelburne, and I urge residents from throughout this region uh, to examine what their community's done and ask what more might we do. The 31, 33, 1 through 33, that's a lot and it encompasses a lot of different things. Is this all doable in a year? I mean, 33 things, they include everything from lots of loan money to rehab, you know, apartments to building youth homes to... I think as indicated, this is a couple of year strategy that we'll, roll, that, that we'll be rolling out, but it's a very ambitious strategy. No question about it. This is a very ambitious strategy. But uh, we think that it is doable. Uh, we've established some benchmarks, some standards to, to, to strive to achieve, and we'll do our best uh, with the resources that we have. And we'll be chasing down every resource at both the state and the federal level to make this happen. Suffice it to say, this is not going to happen if it's dependent upon property tax dollars to support it. We need help from the feds, from the state, from our local financial institutions. How does this affect people who are renters who are not on subsidized housing? I mean, or is it just for people who, you know, I mean, housing is expensive you know, for me, and I'm not on any sort of subsidy or anything like that. I mean, is it, uh, is it kind of a trickle down effect? No. No, you're not going to find any trickle down here. Well, I mean, like, table. people who are, who are on subsidies are in other apartments that people like myself could be in, and if they're in a different apartment, then there's more room for other people. You've taken us full circle to the beginning, which is why we said there isn't one affordability gap. And the reason we have the housing tenure ladder is some people need assistance to get into home ownership, be it condo or single family. Some people need assistance just to afford a rent. So yes, we have assistance for folks at all, all levels of income. And that's why you see a broad range of goals. All 33, all those goals are based on funds that we anticipate this year. Many of those projects are in the pipeline, are already underway. Those are certain to come to pass in the next two years. We hope at the end of the next, of those two years, that those kinds of resources will still be available to continue. But 100 units over two years does not replace what we've lost in units that are affordable to people. So we're talking about keeping pace, and that's why in spite of what looks like an ambitious agenda, what's missing is we lost 50 units of affordable housing in a fire here. So we're replacing two times what we lost there. And so your housing is something that deteriorates over time, and it constantly has to be reinvested in. So a city even that had all high income would have to constantly reinvest in its housing stock. And so this ambitious schedule is what we're trying to do to keep keep pace with a bit very big need, and we're trying to point out to you also the things that we can't uh, reach. And let, let me also point out, if you look carefully at these actions, this is not simply about subsidizing people's rents. I mean, there are actions here which make Burlington a more livable community for all of us that deal with minimum housing enforcement, zoning enforcement, that deal with providing home ownership opportunities. So again, we're attempting to address the broad range of, of housing needs, and if we're successful in doing so, this will be a better community for, for all residents of Burlington, from the richest to those that are homeless. This is important, critically important, to everyone that lives in this city. Mary, so this is an ambitious plan, and you're going to need help from a lot of different organizations. So far, who has committed? Who do you have commitments from um, in this effort right now? Well, again, Burlington's approach to affordable housing has been a collaborative approach. The city is, by and large, not the direct provider of services. The city works in collaboration with a range of nonprofit organizations represented at this table, with the Burlington Housing Authority, with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, 
with a nonprofit developer known as Housing Vermont that is not here today, with the Housing Conservation Trust Fund. These are among our partners, so this is very much a collaborative effort. Where the greatest pinch is coming from, it's from the cutbacks in, the, in federal commitment to housing. The federal government over the past 20 years has essentially turned its back on the affordable housing needs of communities and low and moderate income citizens. And so that saying go, chickens are coming home to roost. Uh, but we're seeing the impact of it. This is not something that happened overnight. This has been a very gradual erosion of the federal commitment to affordable housing that was ignited by Ronald Reagan, but it has continued unabated through the first term of Bill Clinton. I guess then you, have, you feel you have the commitments you need right now. And absolutely not. That's why we have a crisis. If, if, if we had the commitments that were necessary to address the affordable housing needs of this country, we would not have a crisis. We do not have the commitments necessary. And we have an action plan which attempts to be pragmatic and attempts to match the proposed actions with a reasonable expectation for commitments. But even if every action that's listed here, the 33 actions that are listed here, were complete, we would still have an affordable housing gap in this community. Let us recognize that. Peter, I'm trying to get some idea of how big of a problem this is in Burlington, the breadth of this crisis. Do you have any idea how many people are affected by this? How many people cannot find affordable housing right now? Well, first of all, there's, I mean, 40, there's, the there's 40,000 people in Burlington that are affected by the affordable housing crisis. There are 1,900 households that are more specifically affected because they are living in a unit that is affordable through one mechanism or another in this housing tenure ladder. Uh, but there are also many people who are waiting for uh, affordable housing support. Uh, folks could talk to the waiting list. Well, as an indicator with the Burlington Housing Authority, which is only one of many waiting lists for affordable housing, so the Section 8 program, the waiting list now is approximately 1,200 households. I'm sorry, 1,200. What's the average wait? Um, five years. <laughs> it varies to some degree. That's the tricky part. <laughs> so when, when could number 1,200 on the list uh, five years. expect to? Hmm? Yeah. What about some of the other agencies? What are some other waiting lists? Rita, Rita speak to the, uh, the pressure at the homeless shelters. Um, Dramatic increase in the number of homeless families on our waiting list. On our waiting list, uh, last month there were 15 families, which is the highest number we've ever had in the history of COTS. And what's driving that is that even when the people in the shelter have saved up enough for the first month's rent and security deposit, it's taking them three times as long to find an apartment that they can afford as it did this time last year. So for families, we're seeing it. And then um, right now, I know of six individuals who have a voucher in hand from BHA, and they still can't find an apartment that they can afford within the range of the voucher guideline. So we're seeing our numbers go up. But Sarah, what's the uh, waiting list for Cathedral Square? I think our, our current waiting list is probably about 75 folks. Um, and I did want to make one comment. I think we're going to see that grow as a result of some state policies, which are generally good policies. Last year, the legislature passed something called Act 160, which was an attempt to um, shift Medicaid dollars into community-based services. That's a great move, but um, it's going to essentially, it's, as we call it in the industry, it's deinstitutionalizing the elderly. It's moving them out of nursing homes into community-based alternatives. And I think increasingly, in addition to the, the independent and healthy elders waiting for affordable housing, we're going to see a big increase in more frail elders um, who will need a safe and secure environment uh, like a housing project in which they can receive uh, community-based services. So I think we're, we're going to see an additional impact uh, coming our way in the next year as uh, the state policies around reducing uh, resources for skilled uh, beds comes up. Uh, we're also seeing it, Cathedral Square has been moving into assisting 
um, folks with other kinds of disabilities. We just opened a project last week uh, for um, 16 folks with psychiatric disabilities. It was filled like that. I mean, there, there's just, it took about half a day discussion with Howard Center for Human Services to fill that. Um, and while I can't quantify the waiting list, it's, it's very long. So those folks as well have um, a great, great need. What about the land trust? Is there a waiting list for the land trust? I can't speak to our waiting list. Okay, sorry. All I know is we never have a vacancy. I mean, it's, when we have an apartment up and we're filling it right away, and there are people waiting, but I, I can't give you a number. Brenda, do you have any uh, problem filling the most recent the land trust project, the Rose Street at Co op? No, no, long before the cooperative was completed, we had the 12 units full in a waiting list of all 30 people. Mm -hmm. We had so many applicants, and many of them qualified, but once we got through the, the 12, first come, first serve, all the rest are on a waiting list for that, so. Lake Champlain has in development, which offers rental housing, which, uh, yeah. how do you view the need, Ken? We're seeing, I mean, a couple of things are happening. One is people are staying with us much longer. Once they find affordable housing, folks are staying with us. Second, we're finding that the income levels of folks who are looking for assisted housing is increasing more and more uh, people, even at more than, more than minimum wage jobs, are having difficulty securing decent and affordable housing, and they're coming to us. And waiting list now for us is getting to be a little bit of a uh, unrepresentative number to the extent that some folks are so frustrated and we tell them about how long the waiting list is that they almost walk out the door because they realize that's not going to come in time to help them. Other questions? Are you getting, are you getting anywhere with surrounding communities? South Burlington opened a an affordable housing last year, one, one complex. Have any other towns been able to do anything? Frankly, there's not nearly enough going on, but there is some activity, and I think much of the activity that's taking place in, in surrounding towns is as a result of the uh, engagement of the nonprofit organizations, and they could better tell you what, what the nature and extent of that activity is. You're right. Uh, last year, in Champlain, um, with the help of several state agencies and with the cooperation of the City of South Burlington, opened uh, and with the Burlington Community Land Trust, opened I think a, a very innovative um, housing development off Patch and Road, which provides both um, home ownership opportunities through the Burlington Community Land Trust and multifamily uh, housing opportunities through a limited equity cooperative that was, the way it was structured without getting into jargon was a very innovative way to use existing tools. Um, in Colchester, um, the town is working with the Burlington Community Land Trust to rehab a building at 40th and Allen for use as a facility for people <coughs> with HIV. The town of Colchester is also, um, in fact, ground is breaking uh, this week to construct a 40 unit facility for seniors in cooperation with Cathedral Square. So there is, act, there is some activity going on in, in the surrounding communities, but no, no other community other than Burlington has taken the bull by the horns and said, you know, we have a problem, let's, let's survey it, let's find out what that problem is, and let's make sure that when we, that the limited resources that are out there are best used. There's no overlap, no duplication, and that's, that's what les, leads to a document like this. Uh, an agency, uh, excuse me, a municipality, who is willing to be very proactive um, in trying to resolve a serious problem affecting a majority of its citizens. And are there, is there the need in the surrounding communities? There's a need in the surrounding communities, and I think there's a growing awareness of, of, the, of the problem and how it affects people. Um, um, but there, and while there's a growing commitment, the commitment is, isn't anywhere near what it is in Burlington. Yeah, it's not my intent to chastise other cities and towns. It is my intent, though, to suggest that we have an, a regional affordable housing problem that requires, that demands a regional solution. And while Burlington is proud of its record, we need to do more. Other communities, particularly those that have no record, need to do something in response to this affordable housing crisis. And it's, it's important to every resident of this state. I mean. Is this a 
an update of an existing policy, or is this something completely new that's never been no, this, done did, before? No, this is, uh, we have reviewed existing policies. This is a reaffirmation of a housing policy that embraces th this strategy of a housing tenure ladder and that also is dependent upon collaboration, collaboration with the third sector. Uh, but, but this is not totally new stuff. What this is is a reaffirmation of existing policies, a review of past successes, but also a very clear articulation of where we're going for the next couple of years. Okay, thank you all.